Hey, Christ Church, I'm so glad you're here. Excited to be able to worship together. We're about to start in just a couple of minutes, but before we do, I wanna remind you of a couple of things. First, get ready. If you need some extra coffee, if you need to use the restroom, uh, if you need to get your mind ready, now is the time to do it. Second, I want you to engage. Engage with what's happening here this morning as if you're at church. So when we worship, man, let's worship together. Let's lift our voice and sing. And when we pray, let's all go to God together in prayer. When we study, let's join together and get involved in the study of God's word. Take some notes, read the word together. And when we give, let's all give together. Last thing I wanna say is stick with it. Don't uh, uh, give in to the urge uh, to quit and just listen to part of it, but let's finish this through all the way to the end because we believe that from beginning to end, God has something he wants to say to you and he wants to work in your life. And so please engage. I'm so glad that you're here. And again, we're just about ready to start in a few minutes and expect God to do great things in our lives, in our living rooms and in the church, wherever you are, wherever you are gathered. I'm excited about the day. sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin But your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with you Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more And my shame was a ransom me faithfully bore 
Jesus, he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made displayed on the criminal's cross darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand that's when death was arrested in my
this is our prayer. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I fall on you. And Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. church. Let's remind ourselves that God is our refuge and strength in this season through his word. Isaiah 41 10 says, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Psalm 9 verse 1 and 2. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And then verse 9 and 10. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Matthew 43, 1 through 2 says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. Psalm 145, 15 through 19. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. A church family, Romans 15, 13. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound with all hope. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Psalm 27 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid?
living hope, Jesus. We anchor our lives on you and you alone, Jesus. You are our firm foundation. You are the savior of the world. You are the healer. You are the fortress. You are the deliverer. And we can put our hope and our trust in you and you alone today, Jesus. It's you we worship. It's we, it's you who we exalt in this place. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Church family, welcome to online services once again. Love you. Seriously, miss you. We as a staff pray for you often. We think of you often. And we know that God's going to be faithful to continue his work even as we not meet. Even though we're isolated, we're not separated. We're connected as the church. So, Part of us being connected is doing that online or through the app. So take a minute and get on that app. 
uh, make sure to fill out that communication card, drop us a note and let us know how we can be praying for you. That's one of the ways that we can love each other right now. And we wanna stay connected. We wanna know what's going on in your life and how we can pray for you and bring you to the throne of grace. Kids, I know that you had a blast last week with our kids time. And if you haven't worshiped with the kids team this week, make sure to do that later today. You can find that, uh, that kids time video on the Jumpstart email, or you can head straight to the Christ Church AZ YouTube page. And that'd be a great time for you as a family and for you and your kids to worship together. So be sure to do that. Well, church family, Easter Sunday is here, one of the biggest Sundays of our church here, and it's gonna look a little bit different. But what's not gonna be different is our intentionality and, and how we prepare to worship together on Sunday. So this year, our team will be putting out daily devotionals during Passion Week from Palm Sunday to Friday to the crucifixion. And we wanna make sure that you have access to those videos. So get online and follow us at Facebook, or on Instagram, Christ AZ. We'll be publishing videos that are small devotionals for you and your family. We typically see a high influx in visitors for Easter Sunday. We love inviting our friends and family. Um, and this year, nothing has changed. So our communications team has worked hard to provide digital invites that you can get on the app or on the website. So take advantage of that. Go on there, send one of the digital invites to your friends post them on your socials and invite people, okay? We know that this week, Easter Sunday is gonna look a little different. We're not gonna be together at Newell Barney Middle School, but that makes no difference in what God can do. God will still work through that. Whoever God wants to tune in to this video to hear the gospel proclaimed, he's gonna make it happen. And he could be using you, so please be bold. Invite your friends, invite your family. Well, church family, the time in our service has come where we give together. And I just wanna thank you because you've proven to be faithful givers even in this time of crisis. And we've seen that even as the influx of giving has gone to the, the COVID-19 relief fund. Thank you so much for doing that. Also, wanna thank you who have embraced and who have adapted to a new way of giving. You who normally give on Sunday service um, have gone to an online giving or giving on the app. Thank you so much for doing that. We trust and we know that God will use it and has used it already to advance his kingdom. So as we prepare to give together, let me lead us in prayer. Father God, we're so thankful, Lord, because we know that you have provided ultimately everything that we need. You are the greatest giver, God, and that has been seen in the fact that you've given your son Jesus who died on the cross but was raised on the third day to provide salvation for your people. Lord, we thank you for that. And even as we prepare to give, help us reflect on the things that you've given us, God, and may that direct our hearts to be cheerful and to give, Lord, to your mission here um, through Christ Church Queen Creek. So God, use the money that we give. Use these resources to advance your kingdom here. And we pray this and ask this in your name. Amen. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. Lay him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. No praise the name of the Lord. Sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our 
song of heaven rose again. Oh, trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. No praise the name of the sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face come on we praise Jesus in this place oh praise the name of the Lord our God Praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Come on, lift it up. No oh, praise the name of the Lord our praise, O oh, praise His name. Christ Church family and friends. I'm so glad that you have joined us again to worship and grow together in this venue. These are crazy times. Never pastored or uh, experienced anything like this, and I know you feel the same way. And in the midst of all of the uncertainty and in the midst of all of the ebb and flow of information, the one thing that I keep remembering is how much I miss you and gathering with you. How I wish that we were here uh, gathering in church, hugging and shaking hands with hand sanitizer, of course, but definitely enjoying being in each other's presence, worshiping together. And uh, it's these, these types of seasons that remind us how great it is to have a church family. And I just want you to know that, uh, that I love you, I miss you, and I am thankful uh, that you are still staying engaged through this. Stay connected, uh, stay considerate. Uh, stay consecrated. Let's keep following after Jesus. Let's keep being the church. And I know that through this, we can come out having grown and uh, following him with more faith. So good morning and welcome and thank you for joining us. If you're a guest tuning in, you're not part of our church family, thank you for checking us out. We'd love to hear from you as well and serve you in any way that we can through these times. We're going to do what we always do. Uh, we're going to take time to go into God's word and let the sound words of scripture uh, be the foundation of our life. And so grab your Bible, grab your notebook, let's get it open, and uh, let's just engage here and lean in and find your place with me in Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. We're taking a break from the upside down uh, study through Ecclesiastes that we've been in for the last couple of months. And uh, we're going to begin uh, what has become known as Holy Week here this Sunday with Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry of Jesus. And we're going to take the account of Matthew in Matthew 21, and we're going to take a look at what he has to say to us. So find your place, Matthew 21, verse 1 uh, through verse 11. Let me ask you a question. 
Have you ever been in the presence of someone who, when you were in their presence, you did not realize who they were until after you left them? And then somebody came up to you and said, did you know who that was? And then you start realizing uh, who it was and then analyzing how you acted. How did you uh, speak? And, And really thinking about the fact that if you had known who that was, you would have acted entirely different. I love this scenario uh, it played out when I'm on the golf course. Sometimes I'll go play golf and I'll be with a couple of people who have no idea who I am. And golf, if you've played it, you know, has a way of bringing out the frustration in any person. And so usually for the first few holes, while we're still getting to know each other, there's a lot of interesting language that comes out on the golf course. And we usually about the eighth or ninth hole, we develop a relationship enough to where the people I'm playing with feel enough comfortability to ask me what I do for a living. And so they usually say, hey, what do you do for a living? And then I kind of smile inside and I say, well, I'm a pastor. And you can see the pause with the, the people I'm playing with and they're analyzing their actions. And they're analyzing and remembering all of the words that they used in the last hour Uh, on the course in front of a pastor. Now, I'm nobody important, but what they realize is that they had no idea that they were playing with a pastor. If they did, they would have acted entirely different. And now, for the next nine holes, there's a lot of G-rated conversation and a lot of talk about God that didn't exist in the first nine holes. The funny thing is that's the reality for all of us. When we uh, realize who we are in the presence of, or when we see people accurately, we address and act differently. And in our story of the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem to begin his trek toward the cross, we see some people who maybe got it, maybe didn't, but in their declarations saw Jesus accurately. And because they saw him accurately, they adjusted and acted appropriately. We're going to look at that. So you find your place. Matthew 21, let's read it with that as uh, our understanding of what's going on. So here it says in verse number one of Matthew 21. Now, when they drew near, that's Jesus and his entourage and his followers and his disciples. When they drew near to Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage, which was not quite to Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples sent him ahead and said to them, saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, prophet Zechariah, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now over the top of this passage, all of the things that we can see, I just want to point out to you and tie back to this one big idea. And here it is. All who see Jesus accurately respond to him appropriately. When you and I see Jesus accurately, we will always respond to him appropriately. We will know who it is that we are following And being clear on who it is that we are following affects how we respond to him. And we do that in an appropriate way. We don't have to one day realize who it is we're following and then have to think, how did I act? What did I do? When we see him accurately, we respond to him appropriately. Man, what a great season for us. During the upheaval in the world, 
during all of the uncertainty, during all of the change of our schedules, to be a people who see Jesus clearly, to refresh our memory of who he is, and then choose to respond to him through this season and the rest of our life appropriately. And so many in our world do not respond to Christ appropriately. They do not respond to him in the ways that we're gonna see we ought to, and it really is, is, is because they just don't see him accurately. So may God's people, may you, May we as a church, may we as followers of Jesus see him accurately so that we will make the appropriate response to him in following him and obeying him. And so what is the accurate and what is appropriate? What's the accurate way to see him? What's the appropriate way to respond to him? That's the question we're gonna answer from our study of Matthew 21. How must I see him? How must I respond? So we're gonna do it this way. There's four of them that I want you to see, four truths and responses. So here's how we'll do it. Accurate and appropriate. Number one, he is the sovereign Lord, so I submit. He is the sovereign Lord, so I submit. Jesus was never, you can see it from our story we just read, taken by surprise, nor was he ever out of control of his circumstances. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's uh, on his way to begin his trek starting on that day to the end of the week towards the cross of crucifixion. He knew what was lying ahead of him. He knew what he was headed toward. He knew exactly what was taking place. And going into that city, he sends two of his disciples ahead to get the donkey and its colt tied up waiting for him. He tells them that if anyone asks them, what are you doing? Why are you taking my donkey or colt? They are to tell them the Lord needs them. I was thinking about this in context of today. Let's just imagine that the Lord says to you who live in the Queen Creek area, hey, I want you to go to Florence. And when you enter Florence on your right-hand side in the parking lot, as soon as you enter, there's a white car. It's brand new. I want you to go. I want you to sit in that car. I want you to turn it on. I want you to bring it to me. And then the owner is going to come out and say, why are you taking my car? And you're supposed to say to them, the Lord needs it. And then they're going to let you take it. That would be similar to, similar to what was taking place here. And here's the crazy thing about this. The disciples obeyed. The donkey and the colt were waiting and followed. And the people who owned the colt and donkey agreed to let the disciples take them just as Jesus had said. It was as if, it was as if Jesus was in control of the events the whole time and everyone, even the donkeys, saw it and submitted to it. All of this was done according to the plan of God prophesied 500 years before in Zechariah 9.9 that he quotes in our passage. All of this must have sounded so crazy to the people. I mean, even imagine Zechariah 500 years earlier being told by God and moved by God to write down these words and this event. Think about as he's writing this, thinking, a donkey? What in the world does that mean? And all of the people involved, whether it be Zechariah 500 years earlier, the two disciples, the donkey and the colt, or the owners, they all obeyed and followed and submitted because they saw him accurately. They saw him as the sovereign Lord. They submitted to his leading, no matter how crazy it sounded or how little they understood. What this means is that they... There in Jerusalem, those following him into Jerusalem accurately saw him as we must see him. That he is, in fact, not just a man, not just a good teacher, not just the starter or the beginning of a religion or a movement, but that he was every bit God while being every bit man. We call this the deity of Jesus. And so when you and I see him accurately as the sovereign Lord, we will respond to him appropriately in submission. You cannot claim to see Jesus as your sovereign Lord and not obey and submit to his leading in your life. This played out often in Peter's life, a man who often responded to Jesus in such a way that showed that he often did not fully see Jesus as God in the flesh. Several times we see uh, Peter recorded as saying, this is not gonna happen, Lord. This isn't going to happen. This shall not happen to you, Lord. In Acts, he says, no, Lord. What he's saying is, I think you are my Lord, but I am not submitting to you as my Lord. And in that, we see there were moments in Peter's life even that he did not see him accurately. Therefore, he did not respond to him appropriately. 
So for you and me, where are we, where are we not responding to him appropriately? What area of your life, what area of my life, what area of our situation are we holding on and not living in submission and total obedience, even if it doesn't make sense, even if we're not sure how it's all gonna work out, where are we lacking this level of submission because we are not living with an accurate view of our Savior, our Lord, as sovereign, and we're trying to control the situation, we're trying to control the circumstances. Imagine if that took place here. But they did it. They saw him accurately as sovereign Lord, so they submitted to him. So should we. So all who see Jesus accurately respond to him appropriately, and we see him as our sovereign Lord, so we submit. And there's a second accurate and appropriate response. And here it is, number two. He is the humble servant, so I honor. Now, in the passage, we see that Jesus is entering the city of, Je of Jerusalem riding on a donkey. He entered not as a conquering soldier. If I were to write this story and somebody told me, you need to tell the narrative about the king of kings entering into the city, you need to paint the picture, what would you say? I would say, man, he came charging in on a white charger, stallion running in as a mighty warrior to remove the Romans out of Jerusalem and defeat the enemy, but not Jesus. He entered into Jerusalem in humility and peace as a humble servant a donkey i asked this question why a donkey why a colt why not a horse when horses are mentioned in the bible they are almost always in relation to kings and war while donkeys are mentioned in relation to the common people the common joe in jerusalem could relate with what he was riding on jesus used the donkey to connect with the common people we read Life wasn't easy for the Jews living under Roman rule in the first century, even more so for the poor. But Jesus embraced the poor. He embraced the sick. He embraced the needy during his time here on earth. And his choice of riding in on this colt instead of a horse was God's way of saying that he came as a king who will serve and save the oppressed. This is the same thing Zechariah wrote 500 years before. Remember, Zechariah 9.9 that he would come having salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. Humble, humble, not, not demanding praise, not demanding victory, but humble, coming to serve. Jesus declared this, the mission statement of his life, that he came not to be served, but to serve. Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The great kenosis passage of Philippians 2 tells us that even though he was, had every right to be and was in the form of God, he had that position. He didn't have to grasp for equality with God, but he humbled himself. He humbled himself so that he could become obedient unto death. He came to serve humbly. This was entering into Jerusalem, declared here, the humble servant king of the people who came for all men, even the common man, the poor man. His followers may have recognized this about him, so they, they did something amazing. They honored him as their king. They honored him as their humble servant deliverer. They took off their coats. They placed them on the ground, and then when they didn't have enough coats maybe to fill the rest of the ground, they started cutting palm branches off and laying them on the ground. They, they literally, in this day, rolled out the red carpet for him. And they said, we're gonna honor you. You came to serve us, and so we're gonna give you this gesture of honor. They rolled it out for him because they honored him in respects to the fact that they saw in him that he came not to demand their servanthood, but he came to serve them in humility and ultimately save them. Now, did they all grasp it? No, I'm sure they didn't. But there in this passage, Matthew saw it, and I think he grasped it. He saw him as the humble servant come to serve. So he was honored. When you and I see him accurately as the humble servant who came to us in peace, with peace, who came to save even the poor common man like me and you. When we see him accurately that way, when we see him in that light, then we will respond to him appropriately in honor. We will roll out the red carpet for him in our lives. We will honor him with our time. We will honor him with our talents and our abilities. 
We will honor him and, 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 and attribute worth and esteem him glorious and worthy with our bodies. We will, we will honor him with our, with our possessions. We will honor him with our hearts and our emotions and our minds. We will seek because we see him as the one who served us in such an immensely gracious way. We will say, I will honor you. I will esteem you worthy. I will esteem you glorious with my life and everything that I have. That's what God's people do when they see him accurately. Do you see him? Do you see him that way? Humble, full of peace and grace, here to serve you and me by dying for us. When we see him that way, my friend, you can't help but honor him with everything you have. May we be those people. May we see him accurately in that way. There's a third accurate and appropriate thing I want you to see from our passage today. And here it is. We who seem accurately respond to him appropriately. Here's how we need to see him and respond to him. He is the savior king, so I shout. He is the savior king, so I shout. The crowds in front of him, it says, in verse nine, and the crowds behind him, all around him, they, 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 they saw him clearly. How did they see him? Well, we can tell how they saw him by what they said. So look at it in verse nine. They said, shouting loudly, followed him, were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So how did they see him? Well, they saw him, the first word they use is Hosanna. It's an incredible word that, that means, uh, I beg you to save us. It's a plea for salvation. Please deliver us. If you want to see a cross reference that's really helpful is uh, Psalm 118, 25 and 26. There the same words are used when the psalmist writes, save us, we pray, O Lord. That's what they were saying. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, save us. So they saw him here as the savior, but then they saw him as the son of David which that's not just saying, oh, that's who his, his, his grandfather was or his great, 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 great grandfather was. What they are saying is that we see him as the Messiah. This is a messianic title, the promised one. So they were saying we recognize him as the messianic king who has come to save us. Now, they may have had different views of what he came to save them from, Maybe they thought he was come to save them from the Romans or maybe to come to save them from poverty. But in reality, he came to save them from their sins and they got that accurate. And so people referred to Jesus as the son of David. They meant that he was the long awaited deliverer. And then they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is that they recognize he was sent from God. So, so to paraphrase, if I may, here's what they were saying. Save us, our Messiah who comes to fulfill God's mission. Save us, we beseech you, as you take your rightful throne and extend heaven's salvation to us. They saw him accurately, and what was that? Our savior, our savior king, the promised one from God. And so, seeing him accurately, what'd they do? They shouted. It couldn't, they couldn't keep it in. They could not keep the worship in. It, exub it just exploded out of them because they said, that's our savior. And it came out in shouting, high engaged worship. It is natural for us to do that, isn't it? We as people naturally celebrate our champions. I remember so often, you've been here at a baseball game, let's say, or whatever sport is your choice or whatever event is your choice. And I remember being there many times in the, the bottom of the ninth inning and, and our team is down by a run or two and we look at the lineup and coming up to bat is our star player. And so we shake hands and we high five and we say, hey, we're down by a run, but our star hitter's coming up. We know that he can deliver the hit that we need. We know that he can and we, we celebrate it. We shout, even at a, at a silly ball game, we shout because our champion has arrived. He's approaching the plate. He's coming to deliver the team from defeat. He's here. That's what they were doing. They saw him come, the Messiah, son of David, the Savior, he who came from God. And they got it right, whether they knew it or not. They saw him as the one who had come 
to save them from their bondage. When people see Jesus as their savior, when you and I see Jesus as the savior king who came to save us from sin, who came to give us the victory over our enemy of sin, then we will be people who shout in praise and worship of him. We will be a place where the the feel of our worship will not be able to be uh, uh, held down or held back. It will explode from us. You and I see him accurately as our Savior King. We will always respond appropriately with a shout of praise. I I just want to talk to us about that because if you have trouble engaging, I mean, in any way, I'm not saying just gathering in church and singing loud. I'm just saying if you have a trouble in, in engaging in, maybe even lifting your voice or lifting your heart or lifting your hands in worship of Jesus, then could it be that you just aren't seeing him accurately? Could it be that maybe you don't see yourself accurately? When we see what he came to do for us, we can't help but see why he came to do that for us because we see ourselves accurately as sinners. All have sinned. That's you, that's me. That there is no hope in us. There is no hope in our religion and in our good works and in our actions to deliver us from our bondage, which isn't the Romans, which isn't the economy, which by the way is not the COVID-19 virus, that our bondage that is way worse than all of that is the reality of sin and we have a deliverer, a savior king who came. When I see myself accurately as a broken, incapable sinner of ever saving myself and that Jesus the king from heaven came to die for me, That's the gospel. I cannot help. I cannot help but lift my voice. I cannot help but lift my voice in worship. I cannot help but honor him with my voice of shout. Pharisees couldn't stand the loud shouting. They couldn't stand it. In Luke 19, they come to Jesus in the same account, but Luke's account, and they say, Jesus, tell your followers to keep it quiet. And I love what Jesus says. He references what we call the first rock concert in the Bible. He says, teacher, uh, they say, teacher, rebuke your disciples, verse 39 of Luke 19. And he answers, I tell you, if these were silent, these people were silent, the very stones, the rocks would begin to cry out because he is worthy of the shout. He is worthy of the shout because he is the savior king. May we be a shouting people of the praise of our savior, huh? So, When you see him accurately as your savior king, you will respond to him appropriately with a shout of worship. There's a fourth thing that's accurate and appropriate I need you to see from our passage, and here it is. He is the promised prophet, so I proclaim him. So I proclaim as the promised prophet. Now, what's going on? So all the people, if you look at verse 10, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. There was an uproar. The whole city was was in an uproar because of what was happening. What'd they see? Well, they saw a commotion. And they saw followers of this man submitting to him as if he was sovereign. Honoring him as if he was their humble servant. Shouting in worship of him as if he was their savior king. And they came and they said, we've got to know what's going on here. We've got to know. People are that way, aren't we? When there's a commotion, we've got to go see. I remember as a teenager in Las Vegas, we often would go down to the strip and cause a a pointless commotion as teenagers, just punk kids, cause a commotion just to see people gather around to watch what was going on, just because people have to know what's going on. And so when they saw in Jerusalem, there was a bunch of people submitting to this Lord, honoring him and worshiping him. They come and they said, who is this guy? And I love what they said. I think there's significance here, and it's not just simple. They said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. It was so much more than them saying, oh, that's Andrew from Queen Creek. They weren't just saying, oh, you don't know that guy? That's Jesus. He lives in Nazareth. They didn't throw around the phrase, the prophet, lightly. They knew when they called him the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee, that there were significant elements to that that was really the fulfillment of a promised prophet all the way back in Deuteronomy. That this was the promised prophet that was come. And I love the definite article, the prophet Jesus. What I see in that, 
And what was being declared there by his followers was that this is the one. This is the one. The one we've been waiting for. The hope of mankind. The hope of your sin. The hope of the world. The hope of Israel. The hope of the Romans. This is the one. I was thinking about this. If you happen to find the only cure for COVID-19, please let us know because we'd love to have that. You would certainly be loud in proclaiming it. I hope you would. I hope you'd go to Banner Hospital or whatever hospital's in your region. I hope you would go there and you'd say, hey, I got it. I found the answer to this virus and the sickness. You, you would go crazy. Now, if there were many possible vaccines, the urgency of the proclamation would be less. But if you knew that you had the one and only vaccine, then you would be extremely aggressive in proclaiming the cure to the sick. There is a sickness in our world. It's a far worse pandemic than COVID-19. It's the sickness of sin. And the end of it is eternal judgment in hell. And when you see Christ clearly, when you and I see Christ clearly as the promised prophet and deliverer come to be the savior of the global epidemic called sin, then you and I will respond appropriately and declare him boldly. When we see him as the way, the truth, and the life, the urgency of the, pro the intensity of the proclamation becomes urgent. And I see here that the people who perceive him accurately as the one proclaim him urgently as the one. My friend, if you see him as the way, then your neighbor needs to know this Jesus. Your loved one, your coworker needs to know this Jesus. Because when we see him as the promised prophet, we will proclaim him boldly and urgently. And that's what was potentially taking place here. So these people saw him. Now, maybe they didn't grasp the whole, the whole weight of this. Maybe they didn't fully understand how this was all gonna unravel and untangle itself and what exactly he had come to save them from. But we do, we know we who are living 2,000 years later after the cross with the Bible in our hands, we know, we know that he didn't come to save them from the Romans. He came to save them from their worst enemy, their sin, and that he was the promised prophet and that he was the one promised that would come out of Nazareth and come out of Galilee, that this is the one. And so we who see him accurately in that way proclaim him appropriately because the hope of the world rests there in him. You cannot see him clearly as the one and only hope for the sin-sick world and not proclaim him boldly to those around you. You can't do it. So, all, big idea, here we go. All who see Jesus accurately respond to him appropriately. When you get a chance to meet someone famous, uh, I, I've met very few famous people in my life. But when I get a chance, and, and there's been one or two times when my wife is with me, and, and I'm a little bit, I'm not a starstruck person, but I'm like, hey, that, that's that guy. My wife uh, is a little bit less impressed usually, and we usually walk away, and I say something like this. Do you know who that was? Do you know who that was? And you acted like you didn't care. Do you know who that was? And I want to say to you about Jesus, do you know who that is? Do you know who that is? If you do know who that is, then you would submit to him because you would know he's the sovereign Lord. If you didn't know who that was, then you would honor him because you would see that he is the humble servant. If you did know who that was, then you would shout his praise because you would see him as the savior king. And if you did know who that was, then you would proclaim him to the lost because you would see him as the promised prophet. So if you... If you, if you haven't already, then on this day, first day of Holy Week, that's leading us on this journey to the cross and then to the celebration of the resurrection, hey, take advantage of the opportunity that you have with maybe some extra time and some extra space to remember who he is. Go back and find how he is all of these things that he was recognized as. Study the passages in the Gospels. Each day this week, starting with the triumphal entry, follow Jesus to the cross. Increase your clarity of how you see him and your family sees him. For that will ultimately determine how you and your family 
responds to him. All who see him accurately respond to him appropriately. May we be those people during this season, during Easter resurrection season, be the people who see him accurately and always respond to him appropriately. I'm gonna give you a few takeaways. We call these learning to live around here. I want you to write these down. These are meant for you to ask yourself just kind of some takeaway questions that you can reflect on over the course of the next couple of hours as you spend some time with the Lord and you learn these so that you will, it'll affect the way you live. So, so let's think about this. There's three of them I want to throw out to you. Here they are. You can write them down quickly. Here it is. Number one, what is my standing with Jesus today? What is my standing? What's your standing with Jesus? Maybe where do you see yourself in the story? Where are you at? Where are you represented here? Have you have, do you have this relationship with Christ as your sovereign Lord, as your humble servant, as your savior king, as the promised prophet? Do you see him accurately? Are you still trying to figure out who he is? Can I tell you that that's the basis of all of our, our eternal hope is what we do with Jesus. What you do with Jesus determines where you spend eternity. It determines the, the freedom you have from your sin and the victory you experience in your life. It comes down to what you have uh, what done with Jesus. What is your standing with Jesus today? Be honest, please. There's no fake it. There's no religious actions or duties that make up for a lack of a relationship with Christ. Let's start there. Second question. How is my accuracy and appropriateness reinforced? So, so, so if I need to see him clearly, accurately, and then I need to respond to him appropriately, how is that reinforced in your life? What are you doing to more clearly see him so that you can more appropriately respond to him? This, this is one of the reasons why I love church, because we come together and it is there that we, the people of God, declare the glory of God so that we can see him on display accurately and then respond to him appropriately. This is why small groups and Bible study and your time in God's word is so important because it informs you and gives you clarity. So, so dive into your own discipleship, invest into your own spiritual development by seeing him clearly and how to respond to him appropriately. And then lastly, last question is this. How will my circle know what I worship? Or, uh, I'm sorry, let me say it this way. How will my circle know that I worship Jesus? It was the submission. It was the honor. It, it was the shout that made the common people in Jerusalem come and say, who is this guy? It was obvious. It was obvious that the followers of Jesus thought much of Jesus because of how they submitted to him and honored him and praised him. And so the people came and they said, who is it that you're worshiping? So does your circle, think about the people inside your circle, that's your neighbors, your friends, your family, your coworkers, the people who you know, the people who you see, the people who follow you on social media. Is it explicitly clear that you are a person who thinks much of Jesus by how you submit to him, how you honor him, and how you shout his worship? When that's true, then the people will come and say, who is this guy? They'll come during coronavirus pandemics and say, why is it that you still have so much calmness and faith and peace in the midst of all of this? And you can say, it's because I know, I know the sovereign Lord, the humble servant. I know him. I submit to him. I honor him. And he's got this under control. Man, I hope, I hope and pray that you will not just that you not only now see him accurately and respond to him appropriately, but that you will continue to and increase your clarity of who he is so that you can respond to him more appropriately as the days go on. We love you and appreciate the time that you spent with us in God's word today. And I'd encourage you, go back to the passage, read it again, read all four accounts. And I know it will help inform and keep you uh, focused and clear on who he is and who you follow. We're thankful that we get to follow an incredible savior, king, an incredible savior, during this season because we know that if all the world falls apart he's still in control and if all of this ends we still spend eternity with him i hope that's the reality that you're experiencing today because of him and because of what he's done for us as a church i can say with absolute confidence and clarity that you are loved